Good morning and greetings to you in the name of the Lord. Christ is risen and happy Easter to all of you. Delighted that you've tuned in this, uh, uh, this uh, morning or afternoon whenever you're seeing this. Uh, as today, even in the midst of all the mess in the world, Christians around the globe are celebrating the resurrection of Christ. And for that, we thank the Lord. There are a couple of things that I'd like to mention right here at the outset. One is if you are a member of the first EPC family, uh, you will be hearing from me at some point in the course of the lockdown. Many of you already have. Uh, at least uh, some of you have not yet. Uh, but if you haven't heard from me yet, you will be, and it might very well be this week. Just wanted to let you know that I'm trying as much as possible to keep in touch with the members of our congregation, and my hope is, and from what I've heard, uh, other folks are doing so as well. And thank you very much for, uh, for continuing to keep in contact and lift one another up in prayer. The other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, while we don't know yet whether it will be virtually or um, or uh, in person, the session will be having its regular April meeting next Sunday. And uh, between now and Sunday, I'd very much like for members of the church, if you would, to please be in touch with members of the session or myself, uh, if you care to, uh, express an opinion about the subject of what we should do when we come back uh, after the lockdown. Um, uh, should we have a full Holy Week schedule, or should we simply begin uh, with, uh, with an Easter uh, in which the congregation is able to gather together uh, and uh, also have that as a, as a, a, a service of thanksgiving, really? Um, there's also the possibility of simply ignoring uh, the, the holidays altogether uh, on the theory that we've already celebrated them in April and so we don't need to do so in May. If you feel that way, please, please let us know as well. But I will tell you at this point, uh, the, uh, the feeling in the session is that we should at the very least uh, have Easter together, uh, even though we're having it virtually today. So let us know. And let's begin with prayer. O oh, living Lord, on the first Easter, you stood in the midst of your disciples as the conqueror of sin and death and spoke to them your peace. Come to us, we pray, in your risen power. Come to us wherever we may be seeing this service. Come to us wherever we are and make us glad with your presence. And so breathe your Holy Spirit into our hearts that we may be strong to serve you and spread abroad your good news for the glory of your great name. Amen. Christ the Lord has risen to
Father, to say that this is not how we wanted to celebrate your son Jesus' resurrection would be an understatement. This is a very strange Easter Sunday, to say the least, and for many of us, the first one, maybe in our lifetime, not spent in your house with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Today, and in the days ahead, continually remind us that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the God of Jacob, Abraham, and Isaac, the creator of all things seen and unseen, the God who became flesh in the person of Jesus, and who went about making disciples, teaching your truth, healing the afflicted and loving people, even those that hated him. And you're the same God that resurrected Jesus from the dead. And you, through Jesus and your spirit, are with us this day, however strange it may be. Remind us that you are sufficient for every need. Now, Father, though we cannot be together in person, we are united through prayer as we lift up our church family and friends. We pray for Curtis Walker and his family in the passing of his father, Roy. Lord, surround this family with your presence and peace today and in the days ahead. We pray for all those that have suffered the loss of loved ones. Fill their hearts with wonderful memories of those that they've lost and with your peace. We pray for all those that have suffered and are recovering from strokes accidents, infections, and surgeries for those with cancer or other chronic health issues and for their families and caregivers. We are thankful that we have not yet had any cases of the COVID-19 virus in our congregation or in Anna, Jonesboro, Cobden, or Union County for that matter. We know that it is very likely that someday soon we will. 
Help us as your people to do what we can do to care for others, even if it means staying separate for a little longer. We pray for the men and women that work in health care, the military, police, fire departments, as well as those that continue to work each day in grocery stores, pharmacies, restaurants, and other service organizations, that you would protect them and bless them for their service. We pray for those that, though may not, they may not have the virus, they are affected by it nonetheless due to joblessness or lack of business. Sustain them through this time, we pray. We pray for educators and students as they work to complete the school year as best they can. We pray for First EPC Ministries, for the Christians around the world and their families, and for the persecuted church. Father, we thank you for Pastor David and Mary Ann. We pray that you'd protect, sustain, and encourage them in their ministry here and that you'd be with Pastor David this morning as he brings us your message. Fill our hearts. Teach and challenge us through your word. And now let us join together as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 21. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The gospel lesson for this morning comes to us from the gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be. 
to God. <clears throat> the first time I read the New Testament, the first thing that shook me was right at the beginning, finding out that Jesus was Jewish. Jesus was descended from the same people that I am. I had grown up entirely ignorant of that fact. The second thing that shook me was at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is being Jewish, that was at the beginning. This was at the end, and that was that he had risen from the dead. He who had been dead, he who suffered on the cross and had passed from this life was alive. I realized, without being able to articulate why, remember, I had no background in Christianity at all, but I realized that this, if this was true, and if I believed that this was true, it changed everything. I recognized, uh, maybe in a way that, that only someone from outside of the faith can, that Christianity and its claims stand or fall on the basis of this one fact, this one truth, this one reality. And of course, as I read through the New Testament, uh, I discovered that in fact, my initial sense of this was correct. That the Apostle Paul, as he described the resurrection and its significance in 1 Corinthians, affirmed what I had thought was the case, namely that the claims of Christianity, the faith itself, stand or fall with the resurrection of Christ. Paul makes that clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that the claims of Christianity stand or fall on the resurrection. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14 says this, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. If Christ is dead, then nothing has changed. We are still in bondage to sin and to death and to the powers of darkness. It's true that even if Christ has not risen, we still would have the Gospels, uh, which means we would still have his teaching, and that would be really good. But there's a problem. The problem is that we would be without the power to live by them. Jesus' uh, moral and ethical claims and, and commands uh, offered in the Gospels are, are beyond any of us. Uh, even keeping the Old Testament law is beyond us. Keeping what Jesus told us, <laughs> well, all you need to go, do is go to the Sermon on the Mount, to Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, which says, you must be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect perfect. Uh, you can go just there and discover that, um, that we have a problem, which is that we don't have the power and the ability to live by what Jesus has commanded us. I should, uh, uh, yes, yes, okay. So, uh, that, being, that being the case, uh, Paul, Paul says not only is there no power to live by Jesus' teachings, but he also says that there is no salvation at the beginning of this chapter. He says in verses 1 and 2, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, what he means by that is, uh, if Christ is not raised, then you've believed purposelessly. There's no reason to believe in Jesus Christ if he has not risen from the dead. But if he has risen from the dead, then that is salvation. So because the resurrection is so central to the Christian faith, Paul goes on to recount the evidence for it. 
And he says, beginning in verse 3, that I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. What is of first importance is the gospel, okay? The gospel is what is of first importance, not the church buildings, okay? Not the finances, not the preacher. What is of first importance is what Christ has done. He says, continuing in in verse 3, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. What's of first importance is not simply the life of Jesus. That's part of it. But what Paul focuses on as being of first importance is the end of his life and the start of his new life. That's part of the reason why the praise band uh, earlier sang at the cross, Love Ran Red. It might seem like that song is uh, better, better used on Good Friday, and perhaps it is, but it's important to recognize that what we celebrate between Maundy Thursday and Good Friday and Easter Sunday is all part of of one event, all part of of the salvation of the world and can't be separated, can't be, uh, be loosed from one another. You can't just have the cross. You can't just have the resurrection. They have to go together. Now, what Paul says regarding the gospel, what is of first importance, first, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Uh, There are lots of places that we might look to uh, to see evidence of that. Uh, I offer here just one, Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 7. The prophet writes there 700 years before the coming of Jesus. He writes, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Important thing to hear in the times we live in. All we like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah continues. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. This is a description of what happened on Good Friday. It's a description of what Jesus went through and a description of of why he went through it, in order that the sin of the world might be laid upon him. Then we're told, in beginning of verse 4, that he was buried. That's also significant, though it's a fact that we often overlook. The fact that he was buried was a sign that he truly was dead. You would not have put a person uh, in a tomb and sealed them into it unless you were sure that they were dead. Uh, There are those who claim that Jesus didn't die on the cross, uh, that he swooned or that he, he uh, fell unconscious and that uh, he was taken down before he had died. Uh, that presumes an ignorance on the part of first century Romans that simply was not the case. They knew death from life. They knew a dead body from a living one. They didn't take him down thinking he was dead. He was dead. And the fact that he was buried is proof positive of that. And then he goes on to say that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He rose in triumph over the grave. He rose because death could not hold him. He rose because the power of God acted within him to bring what was dead back to life and to do so for all of us. And then he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom 
are still alive, so you can ask them, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the, the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born. He also appeared to me. And all of these appearances are not simply thrown in there because they happen to have taken place. I mean, it's true, they did. But um, the fact is that this is one of the most uh, well-attested events in the ancient world. Hundreds of people saw Jesus alive after he had died. Hundreds did, including the writer of 1 Corinthians, who actually saw him not only after his resurrection, but after his ascension as well by a special vision on the Damascus Road. Uh, the number of people who saw Jesus means that this is not simply a myth that someone uh, put together in, in, in their, their mother's bedroom, you know. Uh, actually, people lived in one-room houses, so they, they went off into a corner of one house and, and, uh, and they made up this, this idea. It was certainly not something that was, was taken from any other, uh, any other religion, mystery religion in the ancient world. This is something that actually happened. And we know that it actually happened because it is attested to by hundreds of witnesses. So it happened. What difference does it make? Jesus is alive. That's wonderful. That's great. That's, you know, that's uh, uh, good for him. But this was no ordinary resurrection. This certainly was not anything like uh, the raising of uh, Jairus' daughter. This was certainly not like Lazarus. Those people died in the end. They returned to life, but they died in the normal course of physical life. When Jesus rose from the dead, he rose permanently, eternally, and because he did, everything changed everything changed. Uh, Paul says in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15, if in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those, I'm sorry, in fact Christ has, there's no if in there, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. That gets to, to the heart of both our problem as human beings and our glory as children of God. The problem is that when Adam introduced death into our species, he passed along that inheritance to all of us. All of us die. Even those who have had near-death experiences or those who, like Lazarus, have been genuinely dead and brought back to life, every single one of them has died. Every single one. The death that we are experiencing now in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic is by no means unique in human history. And it's not just that, that death is, is universal. Uh, this kind of thing has happened over and over again on far greater scales, truth be told, in the, in the Black Plague of the 14th century, approximately one third of the entire population of Europe died. Uh, death has been a constant companion of human beings throughout our existence since Adam. But with the coming of Christ and with the resurrection of Christ, things have changed. Because Christ was not simply a man, and his resurrection was not simply of himself. Christ was, in fact, the embodiment of human nature. He was an individual, yes, but he also embodied human nature in the same way that he embodied God's nature. Two natures in one person, our Lord. One of those natures was human nature, and he was born with the limitations of human nature. 
He had to sleep. He had to eat. Uh, he, he could have gotten sick. We don't have any record of his getting sick, but potentially he could have, uh, probably did in the course of his life. Uh, he was settled in one place. He lived in one time. He lived with our limitations as human beings. But even with that, embodying our human nature, he was capable of something that none of us were capable of, and that was that he could take the sin of the entire world, and he could take the death of the entire world onto his shoulders. And in doing so, in rising again, defeat them, explode them, render them powerless against us. Jesus, the incarnation of God and the incarnation of human nature, he gives us the ability to rise again. And in fact, all people will rise again. Uh, death has been truly defeated, not just for Christians. Death has been defeated for all human beings. All of us will live for all eternity. The question that, that, that stands before each of us is, what will the form of that life be? Will it be a, a form of life that mimics death in hell, separated for all eternity from God? Or will it be a life that is lived to its fullest, the abundant life that Jesus spoke of in John chapter 10? Is that the life that we will have, a life connected eternally to God, a life empowered by God, a life tied to him, a life in which we partake of his nature, one of the most wonderful promises in the New Testament is found in an, an obscure place uh, in a book that, that isn't read all that often, uh, sad to say, namely Second Peter. Uh, and in chapter 1, verse 4, Peter says that we have been made partakers of the divine nature. God lives in us by the Holy Spirit if we are his if we have believed this gospel that Christ has given to us in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, then the life that he now leads, that life is lived by us as well. Not just now, but for all eternity. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to Jesus Christ. Thanks be to the Holy Spirit for their inexpressible gift given to us this day, 2,000 years ago, and this day, today. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that you've sent your Son into the world to embody our nature as well as yours in one person, and that by that incarnation, he was made capable of triumphing over sin and death for all of us. We thank you that you've made us your children. And as we look to the days ahead, as we contemplate the, the sorry state of the world, we know that, that this is not all that there is, that there is glory ahead, even as there is glory now for all those who are your children. Give us faith, Father, we ask, that we might trust in you and rely upon you to bring us through these days and all the days to come, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>
When fears are still and striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in this ground His body lay, light of the world my darkness slain. Bursting forth on glorious day, up in the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, his curse has lost his grip on me. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. receive this benediction from the Lord. May the God of all grace, who has raised his son from the dead, that we might be raised as well to live for all eternity as his children, go with you, be at work in you, live through you, for the sake of Christ our Lord. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye 